My name is Bayate Ross Smith. I am a photographer. A visual artist, multimedia artist. Where are you from? Where uh, are you now? And where are you going? Ideal because they're one of the most feared and misunderstood demographics in American society, historically. They're also a group that's very prominent in media throughout the history of America, but rarely in control of the images and, and, and stories that are used to define them. So by examining them and giving them agency and power in defining themselves for themselves, we're able to kind of deconstruct and question a lot of the narratives and a lot of the perceptions of this specific group that stem from historical and contemporary representations. Um, whether it's movies, books, comics, drawings, painting, um, what actually gets into history books and texts versus you know, all the other things that get omitted from that entire perspective. And hopefully what happens is, as people experience this project and they hear these men talking in candid, open, honest ways, in similar ways that everyone talks, um, they'll become aware of our shared humanity and if they can rethink the popular perceptions and misconceptions associated with black males, hopefully that can apply and be a domino effect that will help um, people rethink their preconceptions about other groups of people and other demographics as well. Just to play devil's advocate with that, how, how likely do you really think that is, that someone will watch something like this and it'll just completely change their mind about what they thought about uh, black men and then it'll follow and they'll be like, oh, you know, they're not so bad, and then it'll just kind of <laughs> domino effect that way and actually make a big change where ideologies change in this country. I mean, how likely is that? Well, I don't know how likely that is in the grand scheme of things. I mean, hopefully, maybe it, it will change someone completely. Um, but the idea isn't that Question Bridge is some epiphany for people to experience, but that it becomes a significant... Um, moment and a significant influence on pushing that needle from implicit bias, pushing that needle on implicit bias in a direction where there's significantly less implicit bias. Now we have received letters from people, particularly um, white people who have, who have expressed to us that Question Bridge was a gift to them because it allowed them to sit there and look at and listen to black men in a way they would never have been able to do so before and feel comfortable and just develop uh, a further understanding, which um, to me is like amazing to hear. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that is it's, all, it's gonna be a certain type of person who's gonna be capable of doing that to begin with. So what about all the other people? Well, perhaps with all the other people, maybe it becomes just an additional aspect of helping move the needle. So perhaps Question Bridge combined with a book that they read combined with you know, music that they hear, a favorite musician, um, combined with another movie, combined with someone they meet in actual life, perhaps combined with these other factors, it can push that needle on implicit bias. Um, and I would like to, to think that if the needle on implicit bias gets pushed on one group of people that has very loaded associations connected to them, that it can impact overall implicit bias. So you are an educator as well, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, just universities? Are you an educator in universities? Um, what's the age group mostly? My first job when I was 16, um, working as an assistant summer camp counselor. And I, got, I went on from there to work with the Boys and Girls Club and other capacities. And then from there, um, once I had formal education through college and into grad school, I started receiving opportunities to work with high school age students. So one of the first 
major teaching jobs that I had was while I was in graduate school in Oakland and me and my friend and colleague Unity Lewis taught a, a class on hip hop art and culture at a school in North Oakland, which was a, um, which was a blessing to be able to do. It was a really fun class. We really had a really good time um, working with the, with the youth there. And actually through that job, I met another really good friend of mine, um, Alex Wezo, who's a, a, a DJ. And um, me and him have gone on to collaborate on a, a number of projects as well. So I started there and then I started working with um, a variety of different programs, working with high school age kids. And then, you know, eventually as I developed more um, work as an artist and built my resume, just working with education in general, opportunities arose for me to, to work at the collegiate level. So one of my first jobs on a higher education level was at the International Center of Photography. Uh, my good friend Lacey Austin is the director of community programs there. And she does a wonderful job um, helping ICP be directly connected to the overall community um, in the New York City area, but particularly making sure there's representation by low-income communities and communities of color. Um, and from there, I moved on to working, still working with community programs, but also working in the visual journalism department at the International Center of Photography. And then I've also been able to do some teaching at um, NYU through the Tisch Photo Department, as well as uh, with the New Parsons, the New School, and a few other institutions. From your ideologies and what you've experienced and um, kind of what you, you seem to think is important, the theme of hip hop, how does that affect your teaching style? Probably a little too candid sometimes. Unfortunately, it hasn't gotten me into any trouble. Um, you know, a lot of times your teaching style has to accommodate the institution that you're working with. So when I work with ICP, for example, when I'm in the visual journalism department, I'm dealing with international students. So I have students from South America, Europe, um, West Africa, East Africa, Eastern Asia, Western Asia. So I have to accommodate my style to one, acknowledge that a lot of times English is a second, third, fourth, even fifth language. Yeah. I then can't necessarily operate from the same uh, space of an understood um, cultural background that everybody has. So from that standpoint, I really try and pull from my international experiences and the knowledge that I have of different areas in the world. And that's why studying images and studying stories news sources, a variety of different ways, traveling. Um, that's why it's important to be worldly and aware of yourself as an international and global citizen. So from that standpoint, um, my style is a bit different. Um, I guess I would describe it more as a cultural ambassador mm -hmm. and a technician, more so then when I work at community programs with the International Center of Photography, a lot of times I'm dealing with a combination of kids who have a lot of access to resources and kids who don't have very many accesses, very many access, very much <laughs> access to resources. So one thing that's great about ICP is in community programs, about half of our slots for our young students are scholarship slots that are based on um, a student's family income. So those classes range several hundred dollars, um, but students can take them for as little as 50 or maybe $20, uh, depending on need. Then the other half is students paying full price. So we do a good job of economic diversity, which is as important, if not more important in my mind, than um, you know, ethnic diversity. Because I ultimately think if you have economic diversity, you generally get the ethnic yeah. diversity mm -hmm. too. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, they're, they're both important. Uh, we just can't forget about the economic when we focus on the ethnic so, um, and gender. But um, in those cases, I'm dealing primarily with teenagers and I'm having to function as a bridge. So I'm bridging the gap between what students have access to and what they see in terms of their resources, as well as helping them see um, visually and analyze images visually in ways they perhaps haven't before. Um, so that's a little bit different um, than when working with international students. Um, at NYU, 
I'm doing a combination of, it's a marriage of technical education, so demoing technical aspects of photography, demoing conceptual and philosophical aspects of photography, as well as emphasizing visual storytelling. But actually, with the visual journalism department at ICP, we're doing um, visual storytelling as well. But we're dealing with it from a direct linear sense that accommodates uh, you know, the cycle of journalism. Whereas with NYU, it's more of an artistic approach. So how, do you, how does each student um, express themselves in a unique way that relates to their unique perspective? So there's elements of being a coach there's elements of being a technician, there's elements of being a philosophical and conceptual um, guidance and force there, um, as well as kind of general mentorship. So what exactly do you do, for example, when you notice that one student maybe has a, a certain, what if you see something in them? Is there any way that you try to harness, or as a mentor, how do you pull that out and, and get them to really express themselves in their work. Is that the job that you found yourself doing? That's actually a major part of my job. So part of uh, my philosophical approach, particularly to image making, is understanding that uh, what makes an image maker, be they a photographer, a film director, director of photography, painter, sculptor, whatever, what makes an image maker, an artist special, is their unique perspective on the world. And so it seems kind of after school especially, but the one thing that everyone can do that no one in the world can do is be themselves. And the one thing that they can do as it applies to creating art and images is convey their perspective in the most genuine way possible. So if you take 10 people and have them photograph the same scene, for example, they're gonna all do it in slightly different ways because they have a different perspective. So a lot of the coaching aspect is getting people to become aware of what's special about their voice and their perspective and their experience and see the connection between that and the images and stories that they're, they're hoping to make. So you try and learn about the person, you try and see what they're interested in, you try and see um, what they're talented at and where they need improvement and utilize all those different factors to help them um, express their perspective in the most compelling way possible. So that includes um, technical instruction in areas that they may be weak in, that they need to improve in in order to have a certain effect when they, when they make images, but it's also about them analyzing and being introspective about how they perceive things and then also studying images in general and being aware of what's happening in society and how current events and contemporary issues shape our, our, um, our perceptions of the world around us. With the work that you're doing in the schools, plus the way you, know, you, very, you have a social justice twang on your art, are you an activist? So for a long time, I didn't consider myself an activist. And I think that's because for a long time, I didn't feel like one can call themselves an activist. I felt like that's a, a label that gets bestowed. Um, but more and more over the years, lots of different people have asked me about that and forced me to think about it in more in depth. And I would say that while I wouldn't call myself an activist in the traditional sense. I think there's elements of activism to how I work and create as an artist, as an image maker, and as an educator. Now I do certain work that's more closely related to activism, like my work through the Kings Against Violence Initiative is very much rooted in activism because we are actively addressing um, issues related to violence and attempting to uh, resolve some of those issues through mentorship, life skills development, and counseling, um, and developing ongoing relationships with young people, and giving them the tools to realize that they have other options other than violence. Um, in terms of my artwork, I think I'm very, mu very much what I'm doing is, in an implicit manner, um, raising questions and provoking people 
to reflect on our perceptions of other people, how we think about identity and beauty, and how that impacts how we relate to one another and interact with one another. So there's an implicit activism there simply because my goal is to get people to reflect on how our society functions and hopefully become aware of how each of us can contribute to improving and evolving that society. There are many people who believe that the only way to really make change is by politics and changing laws, structurally over the board, new policies. Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with the idea that politics is the only way to create uh, substantial change. I think, um, I think that's just um, you know, looking at one small part of the picture. And certainly laws and the political process are significant. Um, but I think our social ideologies and tapping into that and what's considered important um, supersede that. And so, you know, I just think about how public consciousness and public sentiment impacts politics. You know, um, because there's certain awareness about social issues, politicians and lawmakers have to talk about that, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Um, and I think art and media are a critical part of that because they shape our perceptions of ourselves and of other people. And they are how the stories that, we're, that are important to us get told and how we reflect upon uh, important stories, whether they're fictional stories or whether they're documentaries. Um, I think comedy can be a very important tool in creating awareness and um, being socially and politically active because humor can be a great way to address important topics that are kind of funny and create some sort of communal um, awareness, but then also you know, tie that back into something that's important that we have to be aware of. So I think there's a lot of tools creatively that can communicate ideas that don't come across when you're directly talking to someone from a political standpoint. I think it's easy for people to shut off. Mm -hmm. And um, your thoughts, I'm wondering if you've participated in or have any specific thoughts about the Black Lives Matter movement currently? Yeah, you know, I'm really, um, I'm really impressed and really pleased with the Black Lives Matter movement and what it's doing and what it's accomplishing. Um, I participated in that movement directly and indirectly um, to a certain extent. We went out to Ferguson with Question Bridge right. and we participated in a few, uh, a few protests and uh, different activities locally here in New York.